Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 2nd. Today's topic is the liberating new world of open educational resources, or OER, copyright, fair use, and open licensing. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us, and Paula Noggle. Our special guest today is Dr. Royce Kimmins. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Patty Ruffing, who's going to introduce Dr. Kimmins for us and ask the newbie question. Hi, everyone. I am really excited today that we have Dr. Kimmins here for this wonderful topic that we all need. Um, Dr. Kimmins is an assistant professor of instructional technology, instructional psychology and technology at Brigham Young. He has formerly worked as a high school teacher, instructional designer, tech teacher trainer, education outreach center director. He's taught hundreds of workshops and authored dozens of scholarly publications on topics of technology integration in K-12 and higher ed, open ed, and social media. His research centers on tech, technology, learning, social networks, and identity. And as he said, he currently lives in Provo, Utah with his wife and three brilliant daughters. So, Dr. Kimmins, we'd like to ask you our newbie question today. And that is, what's the difference between copyright and fair use? And why is it important for teachers to understand this? So go ahead. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, everyone, for, for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is a great newbie question to start with um, because we conflate the two terms a lot. So copyright is the law, basically the law of what you can and cannot do with other people's intellectual work. Fair use is an exception to that law. Um, so copyright law really applies to everything that you create, every intellectual work that you create. And we'll get into some um, more into that in a little bit. But Basically, if someone wrote a book under copyright law, I wouldn't be able to do anything with that book without their permission. If I wanted to critique that book, if I wanted to quote something from the book, I wouldn't be able to do that. Fair use allows me to do some things with that copyrighted material without their permission under certain guidelines. So fair use gives us some, some liberties for using copyrighted material without permission, um, but it's fairly restricted and we'll actually spend some, a good amount of time talking about what fair use actually means. I think this is important for teachers to understand, particularly within, um, you know, I'm not interested in copyright per se. Uh, I didn't go into education because I want to teach people about copyright. Um, I'm excited about open educational resources. And but what I've found is that as I try to get teachers excited or principals or anyone excited about OER, um, what I find is that they have often a, they lack the need to know about OER. They don't realize what it can do and how liberating and world changing it actually is because they don't understand copyright to begin with. And they don't understand what the restrictions are that copyright places upon us. And so they don't recognize what the possibilities are. So I think that understanding copyright and fair use are essential for us to even understand what is possible with open educational resources. Okay, so I'll just jump into my presentation now. So uh, my title is The Liberating New World of Open Educational Resources. And as I said, I was drawn into this because um, I quickly realized, once I, once I came to understand what OER were, how game-changing they were for everyone involved in the educational enterprise. So, so for teachers, for curriculum designers, for principals, for the people buying resources, for publishers, um, they really change a lot of things. But as I mentioned, whenever I ask someone, do you use OER, do you know what OER are? They're they, their eyes kind of glaze over and they say, oh yeah, sure I do. I use stuff on, online. I use, I use web resources. I use free stuff. Um, without really understanding what OER are and how they fundamentally change just a lot of the things that we can do in education. So 
as I said before, we're going to talk some about copyright and fair use, but really my goal here is to establish a need to know. Um, and I do this when I work with teachers because teachers often have a lot of misconceptions about copyright and fair use. And that's because I think in our teacher education programs, we rarely train them in, how, in what copyright is. Um, I know when I went through my teacher education program, there was nothing um, taught to us on copyright. It might have been mentioned once or twice, just as kind of a, like a boogeyman to worry about, but we were never given any clear instruction about what copyright was or what fair use was. And as I've worked with teachers, I've seen this over and over again, the teachers believe they know what copyright is and they believe they know what fair use is. But when you talk to them about it, it's clear that they, they really don't. Because of that, they don't understand what the possibilities of OER are. So I'm going to lay out just some basic understandings of copyright and fair use, and I'm doing it in a way that um, I think w is meaningful to teachers. Um, with that, though, I'm going to make a, ca make a caveat here that I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm interested in this topic. I've read a lot about this topic. I have talked with lawyers about this. And so I'm going to tell you what my understanding as an educator is of these topics and try to give you some of my analyses on what we can, how we go about approaching these things as educators. But if you want more specific advice about copyright and fair use, please talk to a lawyer. Uh, so why should I care about copyright? As I've mentioned, we, we, we kind of just ignore it in education, uh, especially with teachers. We kind of think, well, we can either, we can use whatever we want. It's really not that important. I think part of the reason for this is that teachers feel pretty safe in what they're doing. They feel safe inside their classrooms that even if they are blatantly violating copyright, that the FBI is not going to come knock on their door. And um, I don't see my role as being to try to tell teachers that that's not a good attitude to have or to be the copyright police. That's not what I want to do. But I think that if we start to understand copyright, it, um, I think there are some other ramifications of those behaviors that uh, are problematic, like they prevent us from sharing with other people. And I'll talk about that some more in a bit. So to start, um, are you familiar with these, these characters that you see here? I think most of us are. As was mentioned in my, my bio, I have three little girls. I could probably quote a lot of these movies that these characters are from verbatim. Um, and all these are Disney princesses, right? And when you talk about copyright, Disney is often brought up a lot because Disney has some very uh, profitable intellectual property that they control very carefully through copyright. They even lobby for Congress to change copyright laws sometimes to help protect their interests. The interesting thing about this picture, though, is that if you look at these, all these are Disney princesses, but did Disney create these characters out of nothing? The answer is no. If you go back and you look at fairy tales, every single one of these characters was created from a pre-existing story that Disney and Disney's authors did not write. Similarly, this hasn't changed recently. So if you look at most recent uh, movies they've created, like Rapunzel or Frozen, each of these comes from stories from like the Brothers Grimm or Hans Christian Andersen. And did Disney get permission from Brothers Grimm or Hans Christian Andersen to, to use these characters? Well, no, they didn't. Why? Well, because they understand copyright a little bit better than you and I do often. Um, and this, you see this throughout their use of, of, uh, of characters. So this was another film that they made into the woods where they brought in tons and tons of characters from tons and tons of stories. And again, none of these characters were really created by Disney. They were adapted by Disney. They took other people's work and they made it their own. And if Disney can do it, then why can't you and I do it? And so I think with teachers, one of the big problems is that teachers and the classroom are so separated from what actually is uh, the basis of copyright, from copyright law, that it leads to a lot of uh, potentials for confusion. So copyright is established at the federal level in the U.S. And sorry, let me just say that. I know we have some international folks with us today. So I'm talking about this from a U.S. perspective. A lot of this will transfer to other countries. The copyright law is national. And so you would need to verify anything that I say against your own national laws um, um, to see how well it aligns with things in your country. But in the U.S., copyright law is established at the federal level. It's enforced through court rulings. Um, and then institutions, to prevent themselves from being sued, they will put into place certain policies that um, will be used as guidelines for their personnel to prevent them from being sued, potentially. 
then you have trainings that their personnel lead with people, then often those are only with librarians or people that deal exclusively with intellectual property, and then they'll just, through word of mouth, mention things to teachers or to educators. And so as you go down this line, you see that teacher perceptions are so, so far uh, disconnected from the actual law that there are lots of areas for misconceptions to creep in. So a lot of the things that I hear often are um, that copyright, is this like patents? Like, and so a lot of our misunderstanding about copyright emerges from our thinking that it's like patents. Um, or uh, fair use, what does fair use mean? Does that mean that I can do whatever I want if I'm in education? Uh, what about the 10% rule? Have any of you ever heard the 10% rule? Well, it's funny because it's not a rule. Um, it's nowhere written in law. It's an institutional policy that's sometimes put in place to help people keep them from breaking the law or to keep them from having to worry about breaking the law. And then also, one of the big misunderstandings or myths is that you have to register copyright for it to mean something. So if I write a lesson plan or I write a book, I have to apply for copyright to the um, U.S. Copyright Office in order to get copyright on it. So lots of misconceptions, but we'll talk through some of these. First of all, copyright is not the same as patent law. They're different, they're different areas of the law. They're different, um, they're different legal considerations under each. And there are three basics that I, I think all educators need to understand, and they help to alleviate a lot of the misconceptions that we have about copyright. First, copyright applies to any created work. Second, copyright is automatic and instantaneous. And third, fair use exists, but it's complicated. So we'll talk through each of these. So first, copyright applies to any created work. Traditionally, um, they used to say copyright applies to any work in a physical medium. So these are things like books, um, pictures, photos, and those kinds of things. But because of the advent of the web, that has been extended to digital materials as well. So, but basically for copyright to apply to something, it has to be in some, some medium where it can be shared, where it can be presented. So here's a, the bolded list here are just different things that are copyrighted. Um, and some of these things might be surprising to you. I think a lot of us assume, well, yeah, books are copyrighted, movies are copyrighted because we see the FBI warning at the beginning. But a lot of the things that you create as teachers are also copyrighted, and the things that your students create are copyrighted as well. So things like lesson plans, essays, poems, blog posts, all those things are copyrighted. But there are things that are not copyrighted. So if something is not in an actual um, deliverable format, then it can't be copyrighted it's a, if it's an intangible. So something like an idea, freedom cannot be copyrighted. Um, Concepts cannot be copyrighted. And equations, interestingly, cannot be copyrighted. So E equals MC squared, you can quote that as much as you want. You can put that in any materials that you want, and that's not copyrighted. Second, copyright is automatic and instantaneous. So the instant you create one of these works, it's automatically copyrighted by you. You don't have to do anything to it. Um, so it, doesn't, it does not have to be registered with the U.S. Um, Copyright Office. Now, the Copyright Office exists to help people who are victims of people who's victims of uh, your work being stolen. So if you create a book and you're worried about someone that is going to steal your book, then yes, it makes sense to register it with the U.S. Copyright Office. And that will allow you to seek legal uh, action against people who try to who steal your work. But you know, that doesn't make sense to do with every lesson plan you create or every uh, poem you write. But this is important to understand because those things are copyrighted by you. And the things created by other people are copyrighted by them. Now, a couple caveats to this is that copyright has, was never intended to be uh, eternal. Copyright exists to protect the interests of an author so that they can create more work. So if I'm an artist, copyright helps me to make a living as an artist. But at some point, I'm going to die, and at some point, my kids don't need to continue to make money off of my work. And so copyright is intended to expire at some point. The time at which it expires has changed throughout the history of the U.S. Currently, copyright expires at the 70 years after the death of an author, of the author. So um, Shakespeare, his works are all no longer copyrighted because he died more than 70 years ago. Um, uh, 
current authors, so like J.K. Rowling, uh, George Lucas, um, their works will go into copyright or will no longer be copyrighted 70 years after their death. Um, the second thing is that copyrighted work can be used with the author's permission. So basically copyright just means that the author can control how their work is used. And so if you want to use someone's copyrighted work, then you can just ask them if you can use it. And then you, you're welcome to use it if they give you permission. Because of those things, the copyright symbol can be sometimes misleading. So if you find something on the web and there's a copyright symbol on it, what does that mean? Well, it might mean that it's copyrighted or it might mean that it used to be copyrighted and it no longer is. Um, what if there's no symbol on it? Does that mean it's not copyrighted? Well, no, maybe someone just forgot to put the copyright symbol on it. So the copyright symbol can be problematic because um, a lot of the things that we see that have a copyright symbol on it may no longer be copyrighted and a lot of things that we see that do not have a copyrighted symbol on them may be copyrighted. So the copyright symbol is useful for uh, as a reminder, but it's not, it's not always clear whether or not the work that it's attributed to uh, is actually copyrighted or not. And the third is that fair use exists, but it's complicated. So everyone can use copyrighted materials without permission under certain circumstances. So teachers don't have any speci special protection under the law. So just because you're a teacher does not mean that you can use copyrighted material any differently than your business friend or your lawyer friend. Um, fair use applies to the use, not the person doing it. Fair can only be determined by a judge. So whether or not a specific use is fair uh, has to be established in the court of law. So there are four criteria. These are the nature of the use, so whether it's transformative or if you're using it in the way that the author intended. So for instance, if I take part of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and I cr critique it. So if I critique a paragraph from it, that might that would be a transformative use because I'm using it in a way that the author did not intend. However, if I'm copying it, so say I make a copy of a chapter of Harry Potter so that my students and I can read it for entertainment, that would be the exact same intention that the author had, so that would not be an example of transformative use. The second criteria is the nature of the work. If a work is informational, um, it lends itself more to fair use than if it is creative. So uh, taking set parts of a documentary looks better under fair use than does taking sections of a novel. And the third is the amount of the work. So basically it's better to take a little rather than a lot. Um, so uh, if I quote something from a book, that's very different from copying an entire book or copying an entire chapter. Um, there is a little nuance to this as well in that um, it's not just the amount of work that you take, but it's also the content of the work. So if I take the heart of a work, so say I take the chorus of a song, that even though it may not be a big portion of the song, it could be constituted as the heart of the work and that might not be considered fair use. And then the last consideration is market impact. So if it's going to impact the author's ability to make money off of their work, then that does not favor fair use. So again, if I, my students are reading The Hobbit in class, and I copy, page, copy half of The Hobbit for my students, what that's going to do, it's going to prevent J.R. Tolkien's um, estate from making money off of that work. And so that would not favor fair use. So to give you some examples of this, of how fair use might uh, work out in actual practice. So let's say my students wrote a paper about The Hobbit and they included some, text, some quotes from the text. Um, that would be transformative because we're using a book that was written for, for entertainment and we're using it for education. We're analyzing it. We're critiquing it. Um, however, it's not an informational text, so it's fiction. So that would not favor fair use. But I am just using a small portion and I'm really not impacting the market by quoting parts of the text. So based upon those, those four factors, even though it's not absolutely clear, that's probably fair use. Um, if, however, I scanned and emailed multiple chapters of The Hobbit for student analysis, again, that would be transformative, but it would not, again, not be informational. It's a large portion of the text. Maybe it's the climax of The Hobbit, so then it would be the heart of the text, and it would impact their ability to sell their book. So that probably would not be fair use. Uh, another example, what if I showed my students a 30-second scene from Braveheart to illustrate historical events? Again, transformative, I'm taking an entertainment um, um, movie and I'm using it for an educational analysis. But again, it's not informational, it's, um, 
it's for entertainment. It is a small portion. There's probably no market impact for a 30 second clip, so that's probably fair use. But let's say, and I, you know, you see this one all the time. Let's say my students behaved in class all semester, so we watched Braveheart on the last day. That does not uh, bode well for any of the factors of fair use. So that's probably not fair use. Um, another example would be, what if my students are creating digital stories with the Kanye West song as background music? That is transformative in some way, though actually it's specifically this slide is no longer correct because I did, did just find out that it is not considered a transformative use of music to use it as background music for a video. And that's specifically written into law. So actually these should be four X's here. So that would not be fair use under any of the, the cases. So that's probably not fair use. Um, here's another example you see a lot. I ran out of workbooks for my kids, so I copied a few pages from my teacher's edition. Um, this is interesting because this is the first case we've had where it's not a transformative use because the workbook is intended for educational audiences. So basically I'm just making a copy of something that's already intended for education. So I'm not transforming the use of it. It's not an informational text. Um, I am just using a small portion, but I am also impacting the publisher's ability to make money off of it. So that's probably not fair use either. Uh, what if I bought a lesson plan on Teachers Pay Teachers? I adjusted it and posted it to my blog. Well, that violates every aspect of fair use. And then here I'm going to make a defense for myself. So I'm using copyrighted images in this presentation. Uh, well, so I'm using them in a transformative way. Um, oh, sorry. Well, let me clarify. I saw a note about Teachers Pay Teachers. So. Teachers Pay Teachers, if you create your own lesson plan and you, you can sell it on Teachers Pay Teachers, but if you rip off someone else's, then, then that's what I'm talking about. That's not fair use. Uh, but so my use of images, just to be kind of transparent in this so you can see my thinking in this presentation. So I'm using this picture of Bilbo Baggins in a transformative way. So it's entertainment, but I'm using it for education about copyright. Um, it's not an informational source. It is, it is an entertainment source. Um, I'm using a very small portion of the movie and there shouldn't be any market impact for me including an image from Bilbo Baggins. Um, so verdict is probably fair use. Now from this, I hope you can see that fair use is confusing. It's kind of subjective. I saw a question in the box about, you know, are all the four items equal? Um, you know, it's really up to the judge. Uh, it's hard to say. And Fair use is not useful in many cases because often you want to do things with copyrighted material that fair use just doesn't cover. So if you're relying on fair use, um, some good words of advice are that you should create a positive defense, go through these four factors for your use, and ask yourself, what, how does my use align with these four factors? And then also abide by institutional guidelines because your institution is there to help you from getting into trouble. And so like if they give you rules like the 10% rule, um, they do that so that if you are ever you know, held accountable for violating copyright, um, you, can, you can have a leg to stand on. And if you are in trouble, then it's nice to have your institution on your side. And if you're not abiding by institutional guidelines, then that's, that's not a place you want to be in, right? So here's the big question. Are you at risk? The answer is I don't know. Um, most teachers aren't because even if a teacher is violating copyright blatantly in their closed door classrooms, the FBI is not going to come knocking on their door. So again, when I talk to teachers about fair use or about copyright and fair use, a lot of times they just shrug their shoulders and say, well, so what? I might be setting a bad example or might not be, you know, living by the letter of the law or whatever, but but you know, no one's going to stop me. And I think that's fair. And again, it's not my role to say that, oh, you need to care about copyright. You need to care about this thing. It really doesn't impact you legally. But I think that there is a bigger problem associated with our misunderstanding of copyright and fair use in that we hide our practice. We, when we create something that we are not sure if we're violating copyright or not, we keep that behind closed doors. We don't share it with other people. And this prevents us from sharing. This prevents us from taking our lesson plans that might use, uh, be built upon other people's work and sharing those freely. This prevents us from taking our classroom activities and making them available to other teachers. 
So copyright is good for teachers because it protects us as content creators in the sense that if you create something, it's protected under copyright, just like a Disney movie is protected under copyright. But their copyright is problematic for teachers because it shackles us in a way as we try to be content sharers or remixers of other people's content. Copyright makes it difficult to do that and also makes it very fuzzy and confusing sometimes. So hello OER. So OER is exciting because it gives us the best of both worlds. OER helps us to maintain the benefits of copyright as teachers, but also avoid a lot of the confusion and problems associated with, with copyright and fair use. So first, let's define open. So again, open is a term we use every day, and it's a little confusing just because it's such a generic term. But when we talk about open educational resources, what we mean are openly licensed resources. Um, so Hewlett Foundation defines it as these are things that are either in the public domain or they're openly licensed, and I'll talk more about what that means in a second. Um, but we confuse this sometimes with free. So just because I find something and I don't have to pay for it does not mean that it's an open resource. When we talk about open, we mean that they're free in that they're free as in freedom. We are free to do with them what we want. So open, sorry, open resources are free because they don't cost us anything, but they're also free in the sense that we uh, can do with them what we want. We don't need permission to do things with them. So there are two types of OER. There's public domain and there's openly licensed works. And Creative Commons is an example. We'll talk about that in a second. First, public domain. So public domain is, again, a term that's misunderstood a lot. It's a technical term that means that copyright no longer applies to something. So anything that's in the public domain means that copyright law does not affect. So um, going back to the example of the Disney princesses, these Disney princesses are copyrighted. but Disney was able to create these princesses from pre-existing work that was in the public domain. So Hans Christian Andersen, Brothers Grimm, their work was in the public domain. So Disney did not have to seek permission from them to take their story about Cinderella and adapt it for a cartoon. Um, so they took an old work and they made it their own. You saw, we've seen this recently. In, uh, any of you seen the new movie? I haven't seen it. I have no desire to see it, but Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So that is an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice where the authors did not need Jane Austen's permission to take her book and adapt it because it was in the public domain. So there are three types of works that are in the public domain. Uh, there are old works, so again, things where their copyright has expired. There are exempt works, and there are released works. So old works, these are just some examples. So Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But even more recent things like The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells has already passed into the public domain. The copyright has expired on that. So if you could find a digital copy of The War of the Worlds and you could print it out, you could share it with your students, you could post it online, and you wouldn't need a license to do that. Um, even some more, re more recent movies, so like even this John Wayne movie, McClintock, has passed into the public domain now. So you could take that movie you could change that movie. You could make your own version of the movie. That's actually a really interesting case because you see the, the tagline here. It says, he tamed the West, but could he tame her? This movie was actually based on the Shakespearean play. So it's an example of Shakespeare wrote a play that passed in the public domain. These movie makers took that play, and they made a movie out of it. And now that movie is passed in the public domain. So we see this cycle um, going on. Um, some exempt works are the U.S. government, when they employ people to do work for them, will often require that what they create is automatically put into the public domain. So for instance, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, if you go to their website, they have tons of images that uh, whenever they take a picture, it's automatically placed in the public domain. It's considered to be the public's um, resource because they are funded by the U.S. government. Uh, so those are some examples. Um, but then also there are examples of people who actually create work and just release it to the public domain just because. So LibriVox is a great example of this. This is a nonprofit website where they take public domain books like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and people will volunteer and create audiobooks from those public domain books, and then they will release the audiobooks into the public domain as well. Project Gutenberg is a great resource as well. This is probably my favorite public domain resource. Because uh, my licensure is in secondary English teaching, and so I'm really interested in the classics. 
And so Project Gutenberg, these are, this is a nonprofit where people have come together to digitize um, all the classics that are now in the public domain. So you can go on there and find everything from Pride and Prejudice to The Art of War. And it's all there, it's all available, and you can do with it whatever you want. As I mentioned, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, their image gallery is all in the public domain. Um, and if we look at any of these, we can, we can quickly see that. So Project Gutenberg has novels like Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. The license is the public domain. So with that, we're free to share and remix it. And there are no conditions. We don't have to do anything. We don't even have to cite it. You could take, and you know, this may sound kind of crazy to you, but it's true. You could take Pride and Prejudice. You could, you could remove Jane Austen's name. You could put your name on it. And you could sell that book. Um, there is no copyright restriction on it anymore. Now, that might not be ethical, but it's legal. Um, another example is Fish and Wildlife Service. Again, these images are in the public domain, so you can share and remix them. You don't even have to cite them. Now, public domain is great, but it's mainly old stuff. It's hard to know if stuff is in the public domain, so there is no timer that, that goes off and tells you, now this work is in the public domain. You have a limited selection. And in some ways, it can feel too free for people because if you create something and you put it in the public domain, basically what you're saying is anyone can use this and they don't even have to cite me. They don't even have to give me recognition for this. So if you create something, you might have some reservations about putting it in the public domain. So this is where Creative Commons and open licensing come in, come in. So Creative Commons is an example of an open license. And what this is is if you create something, as a content creator, remember, when you create something, it's automatically copyrighted by you. You can decide to release it to the community under a new license. In this case, Creative Commons is an open license that means that other people can use your work if they do certain things. So at its core, Creative Commons means that anyone can share your work, they can remix your work without additional permission from, from you as the copyright holder, but there are a few restrictions and guidelines, um, which we'll talk about in a second. So quick example of this is Wikipedia. I'm sure everyone here has used Wikipedia at some point. If you scroll down to the bottom of a Wikipedia page, you will see it says text is available under Creative Commons license. What that means is that any Wikipedia stuff that you come across, you are free to use. You're free to print it. You're free to share it. You just need to follow the Creative Commons um, restrictions. Similarly, uh, a lot of the images you find online are released under Creative Commons. This is from Wikimedia Commons. Um, in this case, it tells us explicitly, you are free to share, to remix, as long as you attribute it, and as long as you share alike, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a second. Flickr has a Creative Commons um, area as well. So if you go to Flickr.com, I believe it's Flickr.com slash Creative Commons, they have millions and millions and millions of photos that you are, again, are free to use as long as you cite them. And with YouTube even has some Creative Commons resources. If you scroll down, you can find the license for YouTube videos. By default, they don't use a Creative Commons license. They use what's called the YouTube license, which is not an open license. But, but there are still a lot of Creative Commons license stuff on YouTube. So to find that stuff on YouTube, whenever you do a YouTube search, all you have to do is click Filters and you have a Creative Commons tag right there. And so what that means is that any, any video that you find on YouTube that has a Creative Commons license, you can take that video, you can download it, you can adapt it, you can remix it, you can make your own version of that video um, with, without additional permission as long as you cite it. Similarly on Google, if you do a Google image search, um, if you click on search tools and then click the not filtered by license and go down to labeled for reuse, it will return all the Google images that um, are tagged as a Creative Commons or similar license that you can use. So here are the restrictions of, of Creative Commons. So there are a few different licenses. And so when you look at a Creative Commons license, it will say like CC BY or CC BY SA or CC BY NC. These are what those things mean. So by means attribution. Basically, every Creative Commons license requires that you attribute the author. So you need to cite the author. Um, some licenses are shared under a share alike um, restriction, which basically means if I find a picture of a whale and I want to use it, 
in my book, I need to license my book as a CC BY SA as well. So anything that I use that image for, the new thing that I create needs to be licensed in the same way. NC is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's non-commercial, so if someone if something is licensed under CC BY NC, it just means I can't sell it if I if I put it in my work. And the no derivatives means that I can't change it. So if I get a picture of a whale and it's a CC BY ND, then that just means that I can't um, I can't change the color of the whale. I can't uh, Photoshop it and make it look different. So he, let's go through some examples. So this is from Flickr Creative Commons Images. I found this picture of a polar bear. It's licensed as CC BY ND. So this means I'm free to share it. I'm free to remix this picture. Um, meaning, sorry, that's actually not, shouldn't be written that way. So I'm free to use it. I'm free to share it. I'm free to put it in my work. But I can't cite it. Or, but I have to cite it and I can't change it. So I couldn't change the coloring of this of this bear. Articles from Wikipedia. So this is the Martin Luther King Jr. article. It's a CC by SA. So I'm shared or I'm free to share it. I'm free to remix it. But the condition is that I have to cite it and I have to share it in the same way. So if I uh, if I collect Wikipedia articles and I create a, a book for my class of just Wikipedia articles, I'm free to do that. But the book has to be licensed under a CC by SA. CK12 is a great resource if you're not familiar with it. This is a, um, a collection of open textbooks that uh, this nonprofit organization has put together. All their textbooks are licensed under CC by NC. And what this means is that if you use their textbooks, you're free to share the textbook. You're free to remix it. You can print as many copies as, as you want. You can send digital copies to your kids. But the condition is that you always have to cite it and you can't sell it. You can't make a profit from their textbooks. Um, OpenStax is another open textbook provider. All of their work is released, I believe all of their work is released under a Creative Commons BY license, the CC BY, which means that you can share it, you can remix it, but you just have to cite it. So I'll give you some examples of what this means and why I think this is so exciting. Um, OER really started to take off in higher ed, specifically in relation to open textbooks, and it's trickling down to K-12. Um, in part because of the what it allows us to save in terms of textbook costs. So there is something that um, uh, so Tidewater Community College is an example of a community college now that is trying to phase out purchase textbooks altogether, and they've created something called the Z degree. They are the first college that I'm aware of that has a complete degree now that you can complete without ever purchasing a single textbook. And the way that they do this is they use open textbooks and other open educational resources. Um, we have done work with this, um, and my colleagues have done work on this when working with K-12, where we have helped teachers to take textbooks from CK-12 and adapt them for their classrooms. And then they can print those off. If they have iPads in their class or digital devices, they don't have to print anything off. They can just uh, take a digital copy of that and distribute it to their students. And so if we have like iPads in our classroom, we can distribute those books freely. There's no cost associated with it. But if we want to print it off, uh, and this is important for lots of places where maybe our students don't have the same access to technology or maybe our students need a copy of the textbook to take home, we can print off copies of those textbooks through on-demand publishing for 5 to $10 per book, um, which is a bit better than the $100, $150 textbooks that are traditionally used in a lot of these subject areas. Oh, I'm sorry. And the research that has come out of that, and there are some links in the live binder if you want to look into this some more. The initial research from this is showing that students who are using these open textbooks instead of their traditional copyright restricted textbooks are learning. Uh, their, their learning outcomes are equal to the students that are using the, the copyright restricted textbooks, suggesting that they're of equal quality. And that's really what we're seeing across all the research is that um, open resources, these open textbooks, can be just as high quality as the copyright restricted textbooks. Um, uh, and in some cases, they actually lead to better learning outcomes because they increase the student's ability to access the information. They're not restricted by a paywall. So there are lots of benefits to OER. I'm running out of time, so I'm just I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. 
But basically, OER provides us economic benefits. It provides us professional benefits. It allows us greater opportunities to collaborate. It, it allows us to, um, to share things with one another legally and to use each other's stuff legally. Um, and there are great pedagogical benefits as well because it allows us to take existing material and adapt it to our needs, so differentiate it for our students. There are some barriers to OER implementation. Uh, really the biggest barrier is lack of understanding. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think generally we just don't have a need to know because we don't, rec we don't understand copyright sufficiently as educators and as administrators to recognize the need uh, and the gap that OER can fill. So uh, some quick questions, quick takeaways from this. So first of all, say you create something and you want to know how to share it under a, a Creative Commons license. How do you even create OER? All you have to do is label it. So whenever you create your next blog post or your next lesson plan, all you have to do is say at the bottom, this work is released under a CC BY license. And what that means is that anyone who runs across that on the web can use it. They can use it and they don't have to worry about, oh, is this fair use or not? And the only restriction is that they have to cite you. So they have to keep your name attached to it. If you want some help in walking you through that process, there's a chart available in the live binder that will take you through a step-by-step -step process of figuring out what license might be best for you. Um, and you know, it's so nice now that there are so many OER available uh, because you know, a couple years ago it was hard to find OER. But there are just so many resources that you can go to now. Um, I provide a few here, and these are in the live binder as well, of resources I've put together to help train teachers and help teachers find good OER. Um, but that's really my presentation. I know a lot of questions came through the chat box, so I want to leave some, some time for that. Um, so thank you for everyone, and I look forward to any questions you had. Thanks so much, Royce. I did catch your questions. Let's go to the top. Um, What do you think of common sense media and how they handle that topic? Uh, you know, okay. I'm not familiar with their work. So it's, a, it's another example. There's so much, there's mm -hmm. so many people doing this now, it's sure. hard to keep up with everyone. Get the next one. Um, I mean, I, I, I've seen their stuff, I just haven't gone in depth into you know, figuring out it, you know, exactly sure. what they're doing and what okay. I think of it. Um, let's see. Aren't there some cases where organizations have applied to get that 70 year period extended? I guess yes. Well, copyright so in place? I, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't think they can get that extended, and so what they have done is they have lobbied to have the law changed. I and the law was initially put in place, um, I believe it was like 24 years after, so if you write a book, the copyright expires like 20 something years after, um, after the book, mm -hmm. after you write the book. Mm -hmm. But it has gradually over time changed, and the point that we're at now is uh, the death of the author plus 70 years. And a lot of those, it's changed like four or five times throughout history, the history of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that has, that's always been in response to um, artists or corporations representing artists who believe that the copyright um, expiration date is too short. Um, okay. So as long as, as long as Mulan and Frozen are making money, Disney's going to lobby to extend the copyright on them. Um, sure. But but the law applies to everyone. Now, one loophole to that is like Mickey Mouse. So Mickey Mouse passed out a copyright a long time ago, but how Disney has maintained control of Mickey Mouse is they have trademarked him, which is a, a different thing. Right. Uh, this goes back to the lesson plans. Does that mean if a teacher shares a lesson plan on Twitter that you need to get their permission to retweet it? Well, that's a great question. So. Links you don't need. So linking to something, generally you don't need permission to do that. Mm -hmm. So if there's a blog post that I like, I can put up a link to that and that's fine. I can retweet something because it's just a link. Right. Now if I were to make a copy of that lesson plan and host it on my own blog, that would be a different, a different question. And yeah, you should seek permission to do that. 
Um, but if you're linking to something, that's typically not um, an issue under copyright law. There have been instances where people have gotten into trouble for linking to things that they find online, but that was only that's very rare, and that only happened because people were linking to things on a website that bypassed the website security features. So, like if I'm a news organization and I have a subscription-based access to my my news site, I don't want people putting up links that bypass their need to log into my site. So links are fine. You can link to anything you find online, but as soon as you make a copy of it and put it on your own resource, then you would want permission to do that. Okay. Can a school or university ever have automatic copyright ownership of a teacher's work? Or does that need to be part yes. of the contract? That's a great question, yes. So you have you need to look at your contract. So some schools and universities have um, it's written into their contract that if you create something as their employee, there might be some stipulations too, like if you create it on campus or during work hours, then they own it. Um, so you just need to check your contract with that. If it's not explicitly stated, then then you own it. So you own it unless it's written into your contract that your employer owns it. Okay. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but sure. yeah, that, if you have a question about that, you should talk to a lawyer. But that's generally right. how it happens, and some schools and universities, universities do have that written into their contracts. Uh, this goes to the, the Teachers Pay Teachers lesson plans. Mm -hmm. If you purchase the lesson plan, then you can't share it. Is that the case? Right. Right. So it's just like if you purchase a book from the bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You can't you can't make copies of that book. Um, book. So sorry, this is taking me off on a tangent. Books are really interesting, but I think it addresses this a little bit too. Um, it's interesting that our digital media has in some way restricted our ability to share, in the sense that when you used to buy a book, once you finished your book, you could give it to your neighbor, you could let someone borrow it. You can't do that with eBooks, for instance, and so. Part of the push for OER has come in response to a restricting of our rights and our abilities to share based upon uh, the fact that so much of our media now is digital and can be controlled much more easily by, by copyright holders. So it, it's kind of odd and counterintuitive, but in some ways digital media has restricted our ability to share and OER helps us to um, put uh, structures in place that allow us to continue to share even within these digital media. Okay. Um, if, if a teacher purchases a movie, are they allowed to show that in, in their classroom? So that would be a good question for your library folks. Um, mm -hmm. but like most of the so if you buy an educational movie, like through an educational publisher, they understand that's what you're doing. So I'm sure it's written into that license that that's understanding that understandable what you're going to do with it. You're going to show that in class. Um, mm -hmm. If you bought, like I gave the example of Braveheart, when right. you buy those kinds of movies, you buy them for uh, home use. So it's it's called a non it's a non-public presentation. Um, so. Yeah, that's the vi so if you bought Braveheart for home use and then you use it as a public presentation in an assembly or in a classroom, that's not really abiding by the copyright restrictions placed on it. So you, when you buy a work, you're not really buying the work, you're buying the permission to use it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. okay. When a teacher uses Google Classroom apps mm -hmm. with students and the research feature that's there, are those images and related parts okay to use? That's a good question. You know, I've used Google Classroom, but not the research feature. Um, mm -hmm. You just have to. So Google does allow you to filter by license. Um, so you just you'd have to check. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. But you should be able, I would hope, that they would allow you to filter it by Creative Commons in there as well. 
You could also just go to the image, Google image search and search there and set the image filter and see if you're getting the exact same results. Um, let's see. I think you answered this about the, the links. Um, this teacher says uh, they always felt that anything like YouTube providing an embed code is implicitly allowing them to embed it on the credits taken care of by right. the info within the video. Right. So that's why, so with YouTube, for instance, the default license that they use is called the YouTube license. So basically it's, a co it's, it's copyrighted, but, you, but within that license it says that you can embed this, um, provided that you don't change the embed code. Because yeah, the citation and that kind of stuff is, is taken care of within the embed code itself. Um, so yeah, as long as you're using it in ways that the resource allows you to use it, then you're, you're good. Um, but, so say you find a YouTube video and you decide, I want to remix this video. I want to download it and make a copy of it and change some stuff in it. Then the YouTube license would not allow you to, to do that right. because that, is, that goes beyond what the YouTube license allows. But there are Creative Commons videos on YouTube. Those you could download and change and do right. whatever with. Uh, speaking of videos, what about something like uh, lip syncing that students have done or schools have done to to songs and then publish those as YouTube videos? Yeah. So again, you know, I'm not the copyright right. police. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Um, so I think I think it behooves if you're going to do something like that. Go through the four factors of fair use and just make it make that case. Make the case that what you're doing is transformative, that uh, and, and under all four factors, and then ensure that you know if someone did ask you about it, you had a case. But the thing is that like YouTube, for example, they now have automated features that they will find copyrighted images or video or uh, music in the videos that you upload, and they'll flag them and either. Typically, they'll just they'll block it, so they'll just uh, turn it off um, until you can prove to them that you have permission to use mm -hmm. the work that you're using. Um, but but, uh, but yeah, right. they don't catch everything. Uh, I think you addressed this with some of the um, links that you have in your slides. Is there a digital library mm -hmm. of OER textbooks that districts can use as a starting point? Yeah, so CK12 is my favorite. Um, it tends to be more middle school and high school heavy. It's hard to find textbooks for elementary school that are open. I mean, some exist. But yeah, CK12 is great. There are lots of other others out there. So like sailor.org is one. Um, OER Commons tries to collect lots of things from all over the web. Um, but yeah, I like to start with CK12 just because it's well structured. The content is, is high quality and they, they have a lot there. Uh, what about going back to the music? What about playing background music for a, <laughs> a video? I, I don't again, know. I'm not a lawyer. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, again, I would say go, go through the four fair use factors right. and decide for yourself. With anything, you know, there's a risk benefit thing, um, right. consideration you should make, right? And at some point, you need to ask yourself, and this is the whole reason why we have OER. At some point, copyright restrictions are just ridiculous and they prevent you from being a good teacher. And so you need to, we all need to be good citizens and abide by copyright. That's very important. But we also need to weigh risk against benefit and really consider, you know, am I serving my kids the way that I need to and how do I do that given the, the fair use um, guidelines that I have. Right. Let's see, were there any others that... If you do use an image and are convinced it falls under fair use, uh, do you still need to include a citation? Uh, that's... a good question. I, 
again, from the law itself, I don't mm -hmm. think you do. I think it behoves us as a good citizen. And I, you, now you have to ask yourself, why are you using it, right? Typically, you're using it to critique the resource or to make a statement about it or something, and so you want to include a citation so that mm -hmm. people know what you're talking about. Right. Um, but I don't, again, I'm not a lawyer, but there's, there doesn't, there's nothing in the fair use clause that requires you to cite it. And there's certainly nothing that requires you to cite it in APA format or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember seeing that too, Patty. You even have to cite Creative Commons. Right. In some, so, in and, some manner. And Creative Commons, so anything a CC by the BY, that's what it means. You need to cite it. Um, Creative Commons, the Creative, Creative Commons website has a great mm -hmm. tutorial on, on just what you need to cite. It doesn't need to be like a formal APA citation or ML, MLA citation. Uh, really, they just want you to include four things. They want you to include the title of the work, the author, the license, and a link to it. Mm -hmm. um, if you include those four things, you're golden. You can do you can you do what you want with it. Right. Okay. I think. Oh, I guess this. I don't know if this was addressed or not. Um, when you use tools like. Edpuzzle or Educanon or what they changed and Educanon too uh, to annotate a video is is that okay? Do you have to cite the original video? So I'm not familiar with those. So are you uploading video yourself, or are you is the tool bringing the video in for you? The, my understanding is the tool brings in the video. You don't upload the video. Right. So like YouTube, for instance, YouTube restricts, will block you if you're posting um, copyright restricted stuff into YouTube, if you're uploading mm -hmm. stuff, because YouTube can be sued for that. Mm -hmm. So any resource that you use, um, they have to take legal responsibility for the media that they have in them. So if you're using something, a website that allows you access to video, um, you can assume as a teacher that they are, um, that they're responsible for that for that content. Okay. So that that sounds like you can do that. You can mm -hmm. basically Educan allows you to add your own questions to right. YouTube videos. I wasn't familiar so with the other type. So copyright comes into play if you make a copy of something or if you are um, uh, you know, publicly showing something. Mm -hmm. Oh, here was one going back to music. Does any music uh, appear under Creative Commons? Yes, there there's a lot. Um, so one is one website is called Jamendo, J E A M E N D O, I believe. So they have the Creative Commons music. But yeah, if you just search for Creative Commons music, there's a lot you can find. Um, also, one of the really cool tools I've come across lately, and I'll, I'll post this in the chat box, it's a YouTube Editor. This is a video editing platform built into YouTube. And what it allows you to do is take any, so it looks kind of like iMovie, but there's a search box within the, ed within the editor where you can search for, for a video and it only returns Creative Commons video and they have a link for music there as well and it returns only Creative Commons music. So YouTube Editor takes care of all the, even all the citations for you. So it provides you an editor, you can find the video, you can find the music, you can create your own video that's a mashup within, within YouTube Editor and it'll, it'll even do, take care of all the Creative Commons citations. Well, that's helpful. Um, I think those were the questions I was able to capture and the ones that came in during the questions. So thanks again so much, Royce. And, and uh, I guess for some of us, we are still quite confused about <laughs> what we can and can't use. But it was still helpful, yes, I agree. I'm going to turn Good, the I'm mic glad. over to Peggy now, who will talk about our upcoming shows. 
Well, thank you so much, Royce, for this excellent presentation. I know we often leave with more questions than we do uh, with clear um, answers, but you made things very clear. I know I'm going to go back and re-listen to this and kind of really reflect on the things you've shared, but the resources you've shared have been great to really help us find the answers to our own questions, especially as it relates to fair use. Those four questions really help us to make good decisions. So thank you so much for coming to share with us today. We do want to let all of you know that we have lots of great shows coming up, and we hope that you'll join us every Saturday that we have a show. Next week, we have an amazing eighth grade student coming to present for us about making makers. I know you're going to love her presentation. Then the following Saturday is the Den Spring Virtual Conference. So. Um, I hope that all of you will take advantage of that day. It's a full day of learning and sharing, and it's always great. Um, then April 23rd, Desiree Alexander is going to join us about educational branding. And that's something that a lot of times we don't think too much about, but we all have one. So I hope that um, you'll come and learn more about that that day. April 30th, Mike Gorman is going to join us to talk about uh, project-based learning in STEM, and he is such an expert and always has so many great ideas. I know you're going to want to see that. May 7th, we're going to hear all about the Kids Deserve It initiative with Todd Nesloni and Adam Welcome, two amazing principals. And then May 14th, Nate Balcom is going to be our featured teacher. And he's the uh, creator of the March Book Madness project, but also some other student projects. So he'll be sharing all of those with us. So I hope you'll be back to join us. And Lori, feel free to take us on out. OK, Peggy, thanks. Uh, as Peggy mentioned, the spring virtual conference for Discovery Ed Education is coming up. We're not going to have a, a live show on that day. On the 16th of April. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all of his PD re resources in one place, including host your own webinar. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room, and as long as your event is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher. You can nominate yourself as well at this form. Uh, the form's also in the live binder. As you exit the session, the survey should open up for today's session. You can also take the direct link that will be in the chat box. Uh, the Surveys also in the live binder in that resources section. When you do complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Your name now prints out on it. Uh, make sure you ask for this to be sent to a personal email address and not a school email address because schools tend to block these from getting to you. The recordings are in a video collection and an audio collection at iTunes U, as well as in RSS feed format and the entire recording on the website. Special thanks again to Dr. Royce Kimmins, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming.